Hey, good morning, Grow Life family. Man, it's so great to see everybody this morning. It's good to be in God's house. Uh, thankful for the opportunity to, to have a moment to share God's word with you. It's so good uh, to truly be with a church that feels like family. Um, I've had the privilege of, of being able to share God's word with this particular body uh, several times over the years, and uh, it's always a privilege. And I always want to take an opportunity, especially since he's not here, to brag about Pastor Matt, okay? Uh, you've got a great pastor. You've got a great pastor's wife and a great pastor's family. You, you grow life. You are blessed. Um, I, I know the blessing of having a good pastor. My, my pastor, Pastor Mark Q., uh, is one of the best pastors. He is the best pastor I've ever had in my life. I'm only here because of his leadership and, and, and how he has helped me to grow. And so I know the blessing of having someone who's in your corner, who believes in you, who prays over you, who fights for you, uh, who challenges you to grow. How many of you are thankful for your pastor and how he challenges you week after week to continue to grow? So, Pastor Matt, I know you're watching online. I'm looking right at you, buddy. And I love you. And we miss you. And we can't wait to see you back next weekend. So, Grow Life, are you ready? Turn with me in your Bibles or in your phones to Matthew chapter 14. I want to share a story um, that I've, I've read just so many times from my youth. It's the story of Jesus and Peter uh, being on a boat in the middle of a lake and, and a huge storm coming up. And, and Peter does something incredible. Uh, he actually gets the opportunity to walk on the water towards Jesus. It's uh, how many of you have ever heard that story before? Just wave at me real quick. Okay, so a lot of you have heard that story. I've heard that story any which way you can cook that story, okay? Flannel graph, heard it. PowerPoint, heard it. McGee and me, wonder, but like whatever it is, super book. Like I heard it every which way growing up, but there's just certain things. And this is what's so brilliant about God's word. When you will lean into it, when you will read the same old story with a fresh set of eyes and a heart that's open to receive, God will show you things that you never saw before. Amen? So we're going to lean into this story. We find the disciples on this boat. They've just finished being with Jesus and feeding 5,000 people miraculously. And Jesus sends the disciples out onto the lake. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes out to them strolling on the water. Miraculously, Jesus is walking towards them. And they panicked because at first they didn't recognize him. Uh, if I was in the water on a boat in the middle of a storm and then they thought it was a ghost walking, that's terrifying, okay? That's the stuff nightmares are made of, all right? But finally they realized it's Jesus, and this is what happens. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began, uh, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And I want to just stop right here and let you know that from my life, I've been in situations where I was so overwhelmed that I had to cry out just like Peter just did, Lord, save me. Am I amongst friends this morning? Have you ever in your life been so overwhelmed or overburdened or overcome with all of the things that have been coming against you in your life, surrounding you, swirling over you, depression, anxiety, a failing marriage, a failing finances, whatever it might be, that you just couldn't take it anymore and you shouted out, Lord, save me. This is where we find Peter in the story. I have a question and I love this question because it's, uh, it's just one of those things that's written in the Bible that makes you go, huh? What the Bible says is, when Peter saw the wind, church, how do you see the wind? Is wind visible? No. But the effects of the wind are visible. When Peter saw the wind, what he means by that is when Peter saw the size and the ferocious nature of the waves around him, how the wind was pushing the water in such a way that it was dangerous for them to be on the lake. When he saw the waves pushed away by the wind, he, become, he became terrified. Very simply, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write this question down. What is your wave? What I know is true today, Grow Life, is that every single person in this room has a wave. Every single person in this room has something that's pushing them around, trying to. 
trying to overwhelm them, trying to overcome them, trying to push them side to side. Now, let me help you with something because we are on the, we're on the west coast of Florida, right? Waves really aren't a thing for us. But if you ever go over to the east coast of Florida, it is a different scenario, my friends. Okay, uh, my wife and I, we love to go to the Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, and they've got a beach right there. You can see the launch pads. It's beautiful. But there are also waves. And um, I'm not a small man, but I got manhandled by nature, pushed around, okay, aggressively. And I was brave enough to try and take my children. And at that point, it's not fun. You're just trying to survive, okay? I got one I'm holding up this way, one I'm holding up this way, one's running towards me like it was a dangerous scenario. These are the types of waves that I'm talking about. This is how it can feel in your life when there's something in your life that is trying to push you around, to push you over, to push you down. So what is your wave? You don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell your neighbor. You just need to know and you need to tell God. What is your wave? Anxiety, depression, finances, marriage, your children, your coworker, your neighbor, your in-laws. What is your wave? What is that thing that makes you unstable, that makes you unsteady, that causes you to question, ooh, am I going to make it? What's your wave? He says, Lord, save me. He was at the mercy of the waves. There's something interesting about a wave. When you're standing about waist deep and there's a large wave coming, what it does is it always likes to throw you off balance, right? It always likes to push you back a few feet. It takes us out of our comfort zone. It takes, us, it takes over our ability to control the situation. It starts to threaten our safety. The verse goes on to say this. Jesus immediately reached out his hand. What did he do? Reached out his hand. And he took hold of Peter, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you're the Son of God. This is a turning point for Peter. And I believe that if your heart is open today, today can be a turning point for you. See, before this moment in time, before this experience, Peter had spent a lot of time with Jesus, seeing him do miracles, seeing him do incredible things that are unexplainable. But after this moment in time, something changed in Peter's relationship with Jesus. This whole story of what happens on the lake changed his perspective of Jesus. From here on out, he saw him differently. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. How we see Jesus dictates what we can receive from him. Because Peter had seen some pretty cool things. But it was after this particular scenario that Jesus started to see, that Peter started to see Jesus as a savior. He started to see Jesus as his teacher. He started to see Jesus as his master. How you see Jesus dictates how you, what you can receive for him. Because if Jesus is just a man to you, all he can be is an example. You with me, church? If Jesus is just this sage, wise person, well, then all he can give you is advice. But if he's Savior, he can give you everything. And if you see him as Savior, you can receive him as Savior. Because he's either friend or Savior. He's either talker or teacher. He's either suggester or master. What is he to you? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is one of my favorite verses of all time. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Everybody say, in all your ways. I love it when the Bible is clear. In all your ways, not some of your ways, not half of your ways, in all of your ways. What are my ways? Well, the way that I think, the way that I act, the way that I talk, the way that I decide. In all of my ways, acknowledge him. What Jesus is talking about, what the Bible shows us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, is that the only path to be where God has created you to be comes in total dependence. Total dependence. That in every thought, word, and action, I'm going to ask God, does he have something to say? Does he have something to show me? It's only total dependence that allows us to end up in his perfect will. Young person, listen to me. 
old person, listen to me. If you're wondering why it seems like maybe you're not in God's will, start acknowledging him in all your ways, and you will find yourself in God's perfect will. That's what the word says. And that's what this story ends up showing us about Peter, that total dependence on God will put us in the middle of his perfect will. Can I prove two things to you today, church? I want to show you something, and and I hope they shock you the way that I did, because in this story, we see that Jesus is going out to the boat, and the disciples are freaking out, man, okay? Peter decides to go out to Jesus. He starts walking on the water. He sees the wind and the waves. He gets scared. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs him up and says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt me? They step into the boat. The storm stops, and they all worship God. I want to turn your attention, ladies and gentlemen, to John 21.7. John 21.7 simply says this. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. This is another time where they were in a boat and Jesus was on the shore. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, write it down, newsflash, Peter could swim. Peter could swim. He's a fisherman. Kind of an important trait for being a fisherman, wouldn't you say? Peter could swim. Peter could swim. So then why was he afraid of death? If he could swim, if he had the strength to swim to shore or swim back to the boat, why in this particular storm, the one we're focused on today, why was he afraid of death? He had been swimming as a young child for many, many years. So why? The Bible puts these things in here on purpose and is so specific so that we can learn and grow. I want you to remember that Peter could swim. We're going to come back to that. Luke 8, 24. This is another time where Jesus is on a boat in a lake, a separate time where there's a storm. And as they sailed, as the disciples sailed, Jesus fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went and woke Jesus up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Guess what? Peter could swim, and Jesus could calm storms. He had already done it once before. So then why didn't he do it again? This is our key question. I've seen Jesus do it then. Why isn't he doing it now? I've seen Jesus heal other marriages or heal heal other depression or heal or heal or cure other sadness. Why isn't he doing it for me right now? Peter could swim and Jesus could calm storms. These are proven facts that were established before we get to our story. Yet in this story, Jesus did not stop the storm right away. Why? I wonder why. If you're like me, you've had several moments throughout your life where you've been struggling and you've been tossed around by different things, and you've asked the question, why are you allowing this to continue, God? Anybody with me? Why? Why? I know you can. We're a people of faith, aren't we, Grow Life Church? We know God can do it, right? We sing every weekend. He's amazing. He can do it. Nothing is too difficult for me. We sing it. For decades in the church, we've sung it. And then when it comes to our life and it doesn't happen right away, we ask, where the heck are you, Jesus? I know you can, but why aren't you doing it? I have found myself here time and time again knowing what Jesus is capable of and wondering why he's not doing it for me. Anybody else? He does it on purpose. There are three things that Jesus does with Peter. In the middle of this storm, Jesus always has a purpose for our pain, amen? No pain is ever wasted in God's economy, amen? There is a purpose and a reason. If you're in the middle of the storm and you know he can, but he hasn't, it's because it's for your benefit. If you know, if God doesn't do what you know he can do, it's because it's for you. So think about that. Three things that Jesus does with Peter. The first thing Jesus does is Jesus saves Peter. If you're taking notes, write that down. That would be my first point. Jesus saves Peter. He reaches out his hand 
and he grabs up his hand, and Jesus saves Peter. The verse says, when he saw the wind, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, and Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. Why did he take his hand instead of stop the storm? Can we agree that Jesus is capable of both? He absolutely is capable to pull us out of what we're going through. He's absolutely capable of stopping what we're going through. So then why does he make the choices that he makes? Well, he only does things because God is a giver, and he's doing something. He's trying to give us something as a gift. Church, do you realize that your storm is a gift? Do you realize that your storm is a gift and that God is trying to show you something, mold something in you, change something in you that only the storm will draw out? Where you are is on purpose. It's not on accident. God has not forgotten you. Church, I need you to say that out loud. Say, God has not forgotten me. Somebody in here needs to know that. Watching online or in this room, somebody needs to hear this. God has not forgotten you. No, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's capable of reaching out. He's capable of stopping the storm. Why didn't he stop the storm? Because if he had stopped the storm, well, we know Peter could swim, right? Well, he would just doggy paddle back to the boat. Hmm. Maybe Jesus needed Peter to see that no amount of his own strength, no amount of his own talent, no amount of his own smarts, no amount of his own experience was going to be enough to save him. No, no, no. He needed to be totally dependent on God in all your ways. Acknowledge me. Because if God would stop our storm, we could do it in our own strength, couldn't we? And is that what's best for us? In all your ways, do whatever you want, because you got this, bro. That's not what the Bible says. In all your ways, acknowledge me. Why? Because you need me. I created you. I'm your source. If you get away from your source, you die. You may last for a little while. You might tread water for a little while, but soon you're going to drown, and then what? Jesus can stop storms. But he doesn't because it's for our benefit, because he needs us to understand how dependent we are on him. Because once we understand how dependent we are on him, well, then everything changes. Then we're much more willing to start at the beginning saying, Jesus, what do you want? Instead of at the end of all of our bad choices, oh, God, save me. He's teaching and training and showing us that there is a better way. Don't end in an emergency situation with Jesus when you're screaming for his help because you've jacked it up. Start at the beginning saying, God, I need you. I don't have this on my own. I'm totally dependent on you. I don't need you to stop the storm. I need you to take my hand and bring me through the storm. Because isn't that what we do? (sighs) Well, God, if you would just take care of Janine, my life would be perfect. Because I'm not the problem. If you would just stop that over there, if you would just change that over there, very, very few times in our lives are we like, God, change me. We're very quick to say, oh, God, change the storm. Change the storm, God. Take all this difficulty away, and then I'll be fine. No, you won't. You'll be sitting in your own strength, and then when something really challenging comes around, you're going to get knocked around by the waves. But he says, no, no, no. I'm not going to stop the storm. I'm going to save you in the storm. So when Peter cries out for help, Jesus doesn't stop the storm. When you and I cry out for help, Jesus won't stop the storm, but he will always reach out his hand. Every morning he's got his hand outstretched to you, to your heart, to say, come spend time with me. Come know me. Come know my heart. Be molded and shaped by my word. Be molded and shaped by my spirit. Lean into me. Every day his hand is outstretched. As we're flailing around in the waves, his hand is outstretched saying, come unto me. All you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a reason that God doesn't do what he's capable of doing because he's trying to give us something good. Amen? See, God made Peter's perception of his strength and his ability and his experience. Remember, fisherman for many, many years, able to swim, knows the water, an expert on the water. He made all of that experience worthless so that Peter's view of Christ could be priceless. That is what he's doing with us when he doesn't stop the storm that he could. Because it's only when we see him save us that we can see him as Savior. We can sing that he's Savior, but until he saved us, 
He's not a savior. He's just a buddy and a pal. He's just a McDonald's. I pull up to the drive through tell Jesus what I want, and he gives it to me and a toy in my Happy Meal. Until the crap hits the fan, and I'm desperate, and I'm drowning, and I cry out to my one and only holy God, and he rescues me and does something miraculous that only he could do, and then what does he become? He becomes my Savior. See, Peter's perspective of Jesus changed dramatically after this time. Now, Peter was able to see him as Savior. The storm stayed so that Peter could see Jesus as Savior. So the first thing Jesus does is he saves Peter. The second thing, write this down, is Jesus speaks to Peter. He grabs his hand, pulls him up close. Peter wraps his arms around him. Jesus is holding Peter. And at this point, what does he do? Does Jesus stop the storm? No. He's in Jesus' arms, but the storm is still raging. Instead, he decides to have a little chat. To have a little chat. Instead of stopping the chaos and stopping the pain and stopping the incredible lack of comfort, lack of control, lack of safety, instead of stopping it all dead in its tracks, he decides to speak to Peter in the middle of Peter's storm. And what does he say, church? Does he look around and say, man, this storm is rough. (sighs) Man, look, I wonder what caused this storm. How did you end up here, Peter? Why did you allow yourself to be in this storm? Jesus doesn't talk to Peter in the storm about the storm. Jesus talks to Peter in the storm about Peter. He says, hey, you of little faith, why did you doubt me? See, a lot of times when something bad happens, we want to look at all the reasons why. Well, it's Joe's fault. If he hadn't have done that, then I would have done this. This storm is his fault. This storm is my husband's fault. This storm is my wife's fault. This storm is my kid's fault. This storm is everybody else's fault but me. But Jesus doesn't want to talk about what caused the storm. He doesn't want to talk about how bad the storm is because it doesn't matter. He's the Savior. What he does want to talk to you about in the middle of your storm is you. Jesus would say, wake up, church. You don't have a storm problem. Storms are always going to be here. What you have is a faith problem. Like your finances might be in trouble. But listen, you don't have a finance problem. You have a stewardship problem. You're all mad that people are talking bad about you, but guess what? That's not what you need to change. You need less of their approval. You need mine. See, Jesus will change your whole perception of him in the middle of the storm. He's not going to stop it until he has your full attention. I'll tell you what was happening in the middle of the storm. After Jesus had picked him up, Peter wasn't interested in any other thing but Jesus in that moment. Sometimes your storm will stay until you become so desperate and so terrified that you are clinging to Jesus and hanging on his every word, and it's on purpose. It's in the middle of the storm that we focus in on our Savior. And you know what he becomes? He becomes our teacher. He will save us because his hand is always outstretched. But he will teach us. Before he stops the storm, he'll make sure that we learn the lesson that's important for us to grow. That makes him our teacher. In this storm, chaos, out of control, terrifying, Jesus decides to say, oh, you of little faith. Jesus is not worried about the storm. He's worried about his child. If you will see me for who I am, there is no storm that you will ever be afraid of. See, God will leave the storm in place until you get into a position to listen. The storm stays to keep us close enough to hear his voice. The storm stayed so that Peter could see Jesus as teacher. So yes, Jesus saved Peter. And yes, Jesus spoke to Peter. But then the third thing Jesus did is he stopped the storm around Peter. At the very end, he stopped the storm. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Like I said, I've read this story so many times. You want to know why? I grew up in ministry. I'm a pastor's kid, a PK. And being a PK and growing up, 
the thing that I thought made me valuable was how I served you people. And I don't mean you people in a, in a negative sense. I, I love God's church. I love the people that are here. But my value system was all messed up because I thought I was only good if you thought I was good. I was only good if you thought I preached good and you said, hey, great job, Pastor. I was only good if I led worship well. I was only good if I taught that message well. I was only good if I had the biggest event. And if I could do those things and if I could hear your voice tell me, hey, Pastor Jason, great job. I thought, ah, I'm okay. And then God took me through a season where I had no platform and I had no influence, and I had no team. He made it impossible for me to produce so that I would understand that I am loved no matter what I do. He made it impossible for me to do any of the things that I had grown up thinking were valuable, all for my benefit. He put a storm around me that I didn't understand, that threw me into chaos, that broke my heart, but it also broke my pride and put me in a place where I could see my Savior the way he deserves to be seen, and it has changed everything for me. My storm was a gift because it changed how I saw my Savior, and it's changed everything for me since because now I hope you're enjoying this this morning. I hope that it's challenging you. I hope that you've taken notes that will challenge you for the rest of your life. But you know what? I could leave here and think that I totally bombed it, and my Savior is as pleased with me as he's ever going to be because he loves me. He created me. So what is it for you? What is That was my wave. What's your wave? What is the thing that pushes you around? What is the thing that challenges your value? Because God will stop you, set you in a storm until you can see him for who he is. And the minute you do, he becomes your master. Because as soon as he stepped into the boat, guess what happened? The storm stopped. As interesting. Peter out on his own, terrified. He steps into community and the storm stops. Life groups are coming. Get in a group. Be with people. Because God's hand is waiting to save you. God's voice is waiting to teach you. And he'll leave the storm in place until you receive all that he has for you. And when you see him as master, when you step into the community that God has for you, of people like Daniel had, Mishael, Azariah, all of these people that prayed together, that formed a community, guess what? The storm then stopped. Because when we see Jesus for who he is, we have no choice but to worship. It's a correct view of God that causes us to worship. It's our storms that shape how we see Jesus. And we have a choice, church. We can choose our perspective today. Because he's either letting the storm kill you or he's letting the storm shape you. And how you see it is how you'll live it. Because if he's killing you, then God is a vengeful God and he doesn't love you and he never did. And he's not with you. He's just looking to hang you out to dry. But if you realize that God is using the storm to shape you, then you can say, Jesus, have your way. Every inch of my heart is yours. Search me and know me. If there's any wicked way in me, purify my heart, oh God. So is he killing you with your storm or is he shaping you with your storm? How you see it matters. Because you're either a target or you're chosen. They mean the same thing. You're either a target or you're chosen. And all of that depends on how you view God. Does he love you and he's chosen you or is he angry and he's targeted you? How you see God is how you can receive from God. And our God is a giver. And God knows what he's doing. And God has you safely in his hands. So whatever storm, whatever wave is pushing you around, I need you to know that our God is sovereign. And our God is holy. And our God is mighty. And that when we will allow ourselves to be saved by him, to be taught by him, to put ourselves in submission to him, to where he becomes our master, then our only job after that. Our only response that can come from seeing him as Savior, teacher, and master is we have to stand to our feet and worship. So I want you to stand to your feet today. We're going to worship together as a church. Remember, God loves you. God is here to save you, to teach you, to be your master. Will you open up your heart and allow him in? Church, let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hands. Let's worship today. Come on. Hey, thank you for watching our Grow Life Church YouTube channel. Our hope is always to help you better connect to all that God has for you. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a thing. Fill out a digital connect card so that we can stay connected with everything that's happening in and through our community. You can also support the mission by giving online as we continue to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Thank you again for watching. We hope to see you soon.